Edward Said is a professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University. He is the author of over 20 books, which encompass areas as far-ranging as music, literary criticism, and history. The Washington Post has said about him, his writing challenges and stimulates our thinking in every area. In addition to his academic career, he's perhaps best known as an outspoken advocate of Palestinian nationhood. His most recent book, called Power, Politics, and Culture, is a compilation of almost 30 interviews conducted over the course of his lifetime of teaching and writing. I'm pleased to welcome him back to this table for one of a number of appearances. And what an interesting cover this is. I mean, that, Power, Politics, and Culture interviews with Edward Said. Uh, introduction by uh, Gauri Viswanathan. Viswanathan. No, yeah. Viswanathan. Yeah. She's uh. an Indian scholar who used to be a student of mine, is now a colleague at Columbia. Yeah. Right. First, how are, you, how are you feeling? How's your health? We, well, uh, you're hanging in there? Hanging in there. Yeah. Just sort of barely. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, nice. it's tough. It's yeah, tough. it is yeah, tough. It is, yeah. yeah. It's a daily battle. I mean, it, you know, the energy is always drained. Yeah. And I'm waiting for a, a new treatment now um, yeah. because I've exhausted all the old ones. You know what they say? We, we, we can talk about this as much yeah. as you want to or yeah, not want sure. to. Yeah. I mean, they say, I mean, they, I would assume if you have a life threatening illness, yes. you know, you live with the idea of holding on because you do not know with medicine proceeding as fast as it is what's around the corner. Absolutely not. And you have to really, I think, uh, I mean, you, the will counts for, I would say, most of it. You do know, you think so? Absolutely. Oh, there's a, I, I'm a living you example. Know. Of it. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, absolutely. And I think uh, just uh, the enjoyment of life and the more you feel anchored in life as opposed to, you know, a lot of people who get ill want to be invalids before their time. But I think the most important thing is to keep the work up uh, as much as possible and to live uh, every day without a thought for the future. I mean, if a new day dawns and you can get through it, that's a bonus. And of course, the most important thing is to have a good doctor. <laughs> There's no substitute for that. <laughs> a good no, I mean, yeah, good, who's, a good, on, who's on the cutting edge of uh, knowing? On the cutting edge, and whom you, you okay, if you have a chronic illness, yeah. you have to see a lot of it. You know, I've been with my doctor now for almost nine years. Yeah. So you know, it's uh, somebody you develop a lifetime relationship with, and that's it, it's 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 crucial. There's no way of uh, underestimating that. And you you don't feel the need to look around. You don't need the. Uh, you don't. I don't feel anyway that I have to look for alternative treatments. You, you don't need seven. You don't need seven, seven different opinions. No, either. no, no, not at all. I gave that up a long time ago, and I don't look around for miracle cures. I mean, there's a lot of that going around. Yeah. Quacks who feed on people yeah. for that. You're not going to fly uh, off to no, some sorry no. country. And, and, and the good thing about my doctor is that he's he's also an intellectual. He he understands what I do, and his main concern is to give me as much. Uh, quality in my life as possible without, you know, undue sort of interventions. Although I've had a lot of treatment, I mean, a huge amount of treatment. Now, what, what your illness is? Uh, leukemia. Leukemia. Yeah. And so it's what chemotherapy or what? Yeah, I've had everything. I've had chemotherapy. I've had radiation. I've had uh, monoclonal antibody. I've, I've had experimental treatments, and I mean, the, the conventional treatments don't work on me anymore. I have a very kind of stubborn form mm. of it. Will makes a difference. You're well, convinced. I think so. Yes. Will. Does your Will. doctor believe that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's if you're fighting the doctor in the sense that he's trying to keep you alive and you're trying to sort of rest or sink back, uh, you know, then you're at cross purposes. Whereas if you're, if you both feel that you're in the thing together, I think that makes a lot of difference. Yeah. You don't give up because. Well, <laughs> there are things that matter a lot to me. Uh, you know, I mean, work that I want to do. Uh, you know, the stuff that I write is important to me. Uh, my students, uh, you know, the family. causes family. Of course, families, right. I would say, first. But the other things, you know, my, the, the causes that interest me. Uh, now, for example, in the present crisis, I mean, one of the things that really tremendously bothers me is this sense of a tremendous gap between the world I come from and grew up in and the world I live in now. and that What's is, the nature of the gap? Well, the gap, Other I than think, economic? Uh, no, I think the gap is much more than that. It's, very, it's cultural. It's political. It's, you know, just sort of t two different, uh, not really worlds, but they're just two sets of expectations, many, many sets of expectations, and languages that have very little in common, different value. All can be bridged, in my opinion. I, I, in other words, I don't think the crisis is simply a crisis of misunderstanding. I think that there is a lot that can be done by people who are familiar with both cultures and both worlds and that can, you know, can interpret one to the other. I think that's been very, very lacking.
Why? Well, there's a long history of it. I, I think the Islamic and Arab world has historically been, um, because of its adjacence to Europe and the West, it's always been felt as a threat. Uh, there's been a great colonial interest in that part of the world, you know, now because of oil and strategy. And it's, it's felt to be also centrally important because of the holy places, mm. not just in Palestine, but also, of course, in, in Saudi Arabia for Muslims. It's satu the whole area is saturated with all kinds of significance. Everybody claims some uh, part of it, you know, historically or, or actually. And I think, you know, the, the, there's, there's also a tremendous disparity in, in mode of life, in the trajectory. People are going in one direction, and they go in another direction in another part of the world. And there's been a long and deep-seated conflict, which, it, which a lot of it comes from ignorance and misunderstanding. Some will say, as Tom Friedman did today, talking in India, also democracy it makes them different. That, the, that freedom and democracy would have been a powerful stimulus hmm. in the Arab world. I, I, you know, I've, I've been, I'm second to none in my crit criticism of the absence of democracy. I know you are. In, I'm the, in, in the Arab world, you know, yeah. it's, been, it's been very bad. Yeah, I, 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 you, you've been also second to none in terms of a Palestinian yes. uh, oh, in, in your criticism of the Palestinian Authority. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. For those reasons. Yeah, and, and the others as well. Yeah. I mean, the Egyptians, the Saudis, right, right, all no, of them. Right. I've, I've taken them all on. Fair to say. I, th I think that that is a, gr a great problem. But I, but I think, you know, another problem, I think, is the fact that most Americans, now speaking from this side, um, haven't really quite understood what the priorities and what the feelings and issues are for people in that part of the world. Or at least they don't, they don't take them seriously enough. I mean, that these are matters of great moment and issue to people. Uh, and one of them, I think, is Palestine. I mean, the sense that Palestine to most Arabs is a central and now deeply symbolic thing, that Palestinians are suffering, that they are simply prevented from attaining their self-determination and statehood, that they go through this daily ordeal under Israeli occupation for, for years, 35 years now is a source of tremendous, well, I think it's a source of tremendous mystery as to why this should happen. Obviously, from the Israeli side, it's, it's mysterious to me because it certainly isn't going to lay up any love for the Israelis on the Arab side. And yeah. on the Arab side, it's understood that here, the United States and you know, the Western world speaks about democracy and human rights and all of this. How tolerate this situation, which is so glaring? I think there's a lot of anti-Americanism on the Arab side, which, is, which comes from you know, a complete misunderstanding of America, as if America was the White House and the State Department and the no, Pentagon. No. That was it. Yeah. So no one has a sense of the complexity of, of our society here, you know, that there are many currents in it, that the universities and the churches mm -hmm. and the unions and so on all play an immense role in this. I, this is not the time. Everybody always wants, when anybody says anything that they disagree with, they want me to launch into the rest of the program and in debate, which I'm okay. not going to do. Uh, there is also the element, though, that, I mean, you know, uh, that uh, Israel mm. has reason to believe that there are Palestinians mm. who do not recognize their desire to exist, mm -hmm. you know, and believe that if Israel did not have its power and the U.S. support would drive them into the sea. I think and this, this has is going to, to do with you. perceptions. Yeah. yeah, it does. This is, this is here another thing of cross right, purposes. Right. For Palestinians, uh, the central fact of their lives, no matter where they are, is the fact that they were uprooted and dispossessed in 1948 and still have no settled homeland. There are refugees, mm -hmm. four million of them, sitting on the borders. There are the occupied territories, and there are a million and a half pa Palestinians who are Israeli citizens who are second-class citizens. I would, I would bet my last shirt on the following. The main problem for Palestinians is it, deeply emotional and political. But y you, please listen to me. I think for us, the major problem with Israel is not what Israel has done, but that the fact that it has never been acknowledged. I think what we need, I've, I've spoken about this, by the way, with my friend Baron Boy, right. whom I know was on recently. And you two on together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That what we Daniel Barenbaum, the great you know, Chicago right. Symphony pianist right. and conductor. Pianist and conductor. Um, 
what I think is needed, and I don't think it will ever, peace will ever happen without this, is that an Israeli leader has to make a gesture of compassion and acknowledgement to the Palestinian people. All that we've gotten is a sense of, well, we have no responsibility for what happened. You, everything you've done is your problem. Whereas what I think is absolutely necessary is that Israelis, individuals do, but what we need is an acknowledgement from the Israeli government of responsibility for what happened to the Palestinian people. There's no secret about it. Everybody knows that the destruction of Palestinian society was the, w resulted in the establishment of Israel. It's as simple as that. It, you had to get rid of one society in order to plant another one. And all the stuff about the future of Israel, well, actually, I think, could be settled. They, 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 <laughs> what was possible in 48 would have been much better than, but you know. That's, that's another subject into which we yeah. could go. I mean, the, I the question I, of partition, you know, right. you know. But for most Palestinians being asked when they were, you know, roughly 70% of the population to accept 45% of the land and give over 55% to 30% of the population, okay. it, it didn't seem right. But I think I hear you the about gesture, compassion too. terribly gesture. important. And that, the problem of the refugees, well. the problem of the occupation, all of these things will fall like nine pins. If Ehud if, Barak was sitting here yes, at this table, yes. he would say, I made... No, he didn't. A, no, no, of course a, not. A, not in a private room. No, no, yeah. no, no. He has to say, I, look, I've read all the accounts of what happened in Camp David and elsewhere. There was, no, on the contrary, they didn't want to discuss yeah, the but are you, you See, here's the interesting thing about yeah. this. You're not the one to talk. I mean, I would say to you, mm. uh, and, and that, that you raise an important point. I would also say to you, you know, it, it may, are you prepared, mm -hmm. are you prepared mm -hmm. to suggest that the leadership, mm -hmm. Palestinian leadership, mm -hmm. you know, has failed? Oh, absolutely. And you are. Of course, so you're I not the that. one to have an argument with, because no, no. you have been at odds no. with Arafat for... Oh, no, I was at odds with Arafat from the very beginning. Yeah. I mean, there are basic so, principles I understand. that I believe in in this, in this but, struggle. But I think, and I've gone on, you know, a record, I don't say that in America only, I say it over there no, to right. Palestinians that the only hope for the Jews of Israel and the Palestinians of Palestine, the Arabs, right. is co some form of coexistence. There's no other way. There's no, I mean, the place is too small. But, Their lives and histories but, are too but, but involved you, but with do each you, other. I, you, I hear you on the compassion, but yes. do you understand how in Israel yes. there is the feeling you know, yes. that Palestinians do not want them there, and if they were stronger, would not allow them to be there and would drive them out. But then the question is, why is that so? And how long can you keep against the people's will to keep them down, to beat them down, to kill them? Five Palestinians were killed yesterday, Charlie. The occupation is the most brutal military occupation imaginable. Palestinians cannot live in this Well, I, that's part of the reason that Yitzhak Rabin was prepared to go where he did. Fine, you know, but we're, we're not talking about Sharon. Was, Sharon is the, is the prime minister. I understand that. Well, let, let, he, me, let me move ahead to the United yeah, States because right. there are other things to talk about. Yeah. And, and I have great respect for you and also for the issues that you raise. Mm -hmm. uh, this point, Colin Powell last, yesterday in Kentucky made a speech, which mm -hmm. I talked about with George Mitchell last night on this program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw it. Uh, I try think? to watch you all the time. Thank you. What did you think of, of Powell, mainly? Oh, I, look, I thought it was an oh. important speech. First of all, there, was, there had been a taboo for a long time in using the word Palestine. And he used the word Palestine. Well, George as Bush used it yes, at the United as, Nations. As did Bush, exactly. Second, Two to states talk about living side by side. side. Exactly. Second, to talk about a viable Palestinian state with acknowledged borders seems to me a terribly important thing for an American, a high American official to have said, obviously with the agreement of the president. And third, and from my point of view, most important in terms of the present context, he was the first American in a long time to talk about the need for the end of occupation. No. The Palestinians no. cannot go and, on living. And Powell did in his speech. P Powell, that's what I'm saying. Right. Powell right. said it in we his cannot, speech. Yeah. So that's tremendously important. Yeah. Now, George, a lot of Palestinian criticism was as I read it in the next day, was that he didn't say enough. But I think from what my, my reading, which is always optimistic, of the speech is that the implication is that now we're going to involve ourselves in getting to that point. In other words, once you state that this is perhaps the goal, 
then you can begin to work towards it, rather than say, well, we don't really mm -hmm. have a goal, but we're trying to get people mm -hmm. to run I think the so. I, I, I you agree with that? I right? do, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do. Because I, I mean, I do, I believe it because I agree with it because I think, you know, I mean, I think there's certain resistance. I mean, I, there are, and understandable, yeah. there, there, these are matters of high import, and, yeah. and there are people who, who come down on it, who very well come down on it with one side, with, with stronger feelings. Yes. Yeah tilting one way or the other. Yes. Uh, and I mean by that, then and there are some people within this administration, I'm sure, yes. you know, who feel like the violence has to stop, period, yes. period, yes. period, right. you know. Yeah. And, and that violence hasn't been the answer. And there are the people who strongly feel that, that as long as there is, yes. there are occupation, there will always be violence. violence. And so you've got... And counter violence. And there's no, literally no end to it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I think that rather than, uh, and I think that was the problem with the 10 years of Oslo, you know, since 93 until right. roughly now. A, the Palestinian situation, the condition got worse. And as m several Israeli friends told me, most Israelis were not aware of it. They thought, well, we have peace, so what are they complaining about? But in fact, Palestinians got poorer, they could move around less, more of their land was taken, their houses were destroyed, their olive trees were uh, destroyed, many of them were killed, uh, put in jail, etc. So the situation got worse. I think now if you have, as the Powell speech indicates, you have the beginning of a new climate that suggests this is the general line we want to take towards a Palestinian state, towards two states living side mm. by side in some harmonious way, in, I mean, yeah. at the end of the road, then I think these fears, you know, I think will dissipate, or at least be largely reduced. I, that's the most one can hope for, but it's, it's substantial. I think one has to be able to feel optimistic. You feel, you feel optimistic? Yeah, because, I mean, nothing else. I mean, if, if it, you don't if feel it, optimistic, then what is it about? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean, the situation is so desperate for Palestinians well, that... Well, it, desperate. Well, I mean, I mean, just lots of people have lost lives. Yes, lots exactly. and lots no, no, of people know, have lost I know, lives. I know. And, you know. But we're talking about a, a defenseless people, basically, Charlie. We're talking about people who don't have an army, exactly. who don't have tanks, who don't have F-16s, right. helicopters, who are at the mercy of an army that, if it gets angry, they can do it, what they did yesterday. They go into a, a, a refugee camp in Gaza and destroy 20 homes. I mean, that's, you know, on a, on a micro level, this is, this, yeah. is, this is torture for people to live in conditions like that. And I think watching it uh, is very, very hard for all of us. And not only for us, but for most of the world outside of America. Why do you think in the end, I'm, I'm long on this and I want to move to other things. Why do you think in the end... Arafat did not accept the offer that most people believe he should have accepted. Yes, I think there were too many. There were too many problems with it. I think you know when when you're given an offer that is more or less take it or leave it. In other words, this is the final offer. I think that if you're given an offer where you have no boundaries with any Arab country except with, that Israel surrounds you, that the, the three or four large bits of territory are discontiguous from each other. If Israel controls exits and entrances, I mean, too much is left in Israel's hand, then you return it down. Now, my complaint is not that he turned it down, but that he turned it down without giving an alternative. I mean, if I was in this place, I'd have said, look, this is no good for the following reasons. This is what we have to address and keep it going and try to put that case forward. He says he but found no a, negotiating partner there. No, no, there. but that's, there's always a negotiating position, but that was the, that was the mistake. No, no, he said way. that he found, I mean, what, what A. Barak says yes. time and time again is he found no negotiating no, partner no, there. No, no, I, I think that's probably was, true. You know, I mean, yeah. there's some debate within, yes. some of the Palestinians yes. will say, yes. you know, but... And but Arafat is such a, such a genius at sort of manipulating people that the negotiators on their own could do nothing. It, I mean, it, he really is the final sort of court of appeal. And if what he happens doesn't want when to he do, goes? A mess. Uh, you know, there's a designated successor or two, but uh, there are too many rival groups. Uh, there, there are too many contenders, I think. Is he losing? He's lost a lot. Of, uh, of the author latest, authority and... Yeah, well, he's lost a lot of popularity. I mean, the latest Palestinian poll shows that his popularity is about 17 or 18 percent now, which is very, And, very and what about Hamas? Hamas has never increased. It's roughly the same. It's always a, you know, between Characterize 50... Characterize Hamas. Hamas is a, a, largely in Gaza. Uh, it's a, it's an, is, an Islamic group that hopes to establish a Palestinian Islamic state, uh, you know, which is a hopeless proposition, just as all the Islamist ideas in the Arab world are hopeless to establish Islamic states, whatever that means. And you're not a Muslim. I'm, well, it's not only that. I'm also very, very secular. I wouldn't want a Christian state, right, either, right. if you see what I mean. Or, for that matter, you know, any kind of theocratic state. 
I think they are basically a welfare and education organization with military pretensions that will do mm. acts of resistance up to suicide bombing just to keep their case alive. But I think the battle well, for hearts and minds... Bomb, a, a suicide bomb in a pizza shop an act of resistance? Well, they think it is. I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a tremendously wasteful and, no. and something that one has to condemn. Well, in the same way as is, is bulldozing somebody's home. Yeah, I mean, there are all uh, these acts... Unnecessary they're, they're act sort of, on the part of an army. Yeah, they're, they're terminal acts. I mean, they, they, nothing can come from them, uh, you know. So I, in that respect, I think they they're feel as hopeless as everybody else does in this context. But I think that... I think that one shouldn't overestimate their, uh, their, their attractiveness to young people. Thank you. Thank you. Edward Said, my friend. Thanks. We'll be right back. Stay with us.